Hello, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to my talk. Thank you for coming. Um, I hope you had a good lunch. I'm really happy to be there talking at ELCE for uh, once in my home country, France, so it's nice. Uh, and as I do uh, most of the time, I'll be talking about BuildRoot, and this time it's going to be what's new. Before we get started, maybe a quick poll. Uh, who is using BuildRoot today? Well, cool. And who is using um, Open Embedded or some of its derivatives? Yeah. Another fraction of the room, yeah. Uh, open WRT, maybe? Whoa, okay, one or two. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks, so my name is Thomas. I work at Bootlin. We do embedded Linux uh, engineering and, and trainings. Uh, we have all our training materials uh, available for free under a, a Creative Commons license, and we do a uh, numerous bootloader, kernel, build system, engineering projects for, for our customers. And um, even though ELC is in Lyon, I in fact come from Toulouse, France, so hopefully one day it's going to be in um, my city, but it's close enough. And I happen to be one of the co-maintainers of uh, BuildRoot, and I guess there's at least one of the other co-maintainers here, and I don't know if Arnaud is in the room, maybe not, he's not, so, uh, but he's around at the conference. Um, so I, I saw that like two-thirds of the room is already using BuildRoot, so I'm going to go fairly quickly about that. What is BuildRoot? It's an embedded Linux build system. So the point of this tool is to automate the process of building a complete Linux system from source uh, using cross-compilation. So the uh, obvious target is to build embedded Linux um, um, systems for embedded targets. So we have an, an Intel uh, build machine on our desktop, and we want to cross-compile all the piece of software that we need on our target, starting from a bootloader, a Linux kernel image, and a complete user space, which can be more or less complicated, uh, ranging from a very simple buzzy box based user space all the way to a more complex user space with Wayland and GStreamer and QD and whatnot. Uh, so with all of that, in an automated fashion, you simply define uh, what your system looks like, should look like, and it will automatically fetch, configure, build, install, and aggregate all those software components together. Um, so it's a fast build system. You can build a fairly simple root file system in a minute, um, which is uh, a very nice thing. It's easy to understand. It uses uh, kconfig for configuration, just like the Linux kernel, and it's written in Make, which is not necessarily easy to grasp, but at least is a well-known technology that most of the, the folks in the, in the uh, Unix Linux ecosystem know about. So that's, that's nice. It's not a special language or a special technology you have to learn. It's something you probably already know. Um, it produces small root file systems. Uh, the default file system we build, uh, which is a BuzzyBox based uslibc file system, is just two megs. Um, so instead of being something big that you have to like get down to, to reach your target size, it's kind of the opposite. You have something small at the beginning and just add up what you exactly need. Uh, we today have uh, about uh, 2,500 packages, and I think we're approaching 2,600 packages uh, for various uh, pieces of you know, user space software. Uh, and as I said, it can be ranging from uh, fairly simple libraries all the way up to uh, fairly big software stacks. Um, and this is uh, basically the main... Uh, the main thing that, that, is, uh, that we are maintaining, this, this uh, corpus of packages that we try to keep updated and, and that is growing over time thanks to contributions. Uh, this build system produces file system images, so it outputs like an ext4 or squashfs or ubifs image that you can flash on your device. It does not produce a distribution in the sense that it does not have uh, the concept of binary packages that you can upgrade, uh, install, remove individually. It's just one fixed system. If you want to update it, you update the whole system. Uh, it's a vendor-neutral project. There's no like uh, commercial, single commercial company behind it. It's really a bunch of open source people um, working for different companies, uh, either uh, uh, services companies or product makers or uh, hardware makers who get together and, and uh, create and, and improve that, um, that build system. Uh, the community is very active. We're going to see that in the next slides. Uh, we have stable releases every three months. And it was started in um, 2001, and I think it makes it the oldest in maintained build system. I'm not exactly sure, of course, but it's, it's probably among the, the ones that exist today, the one that has been around for, for, for the longest. So that's pretty much what BuildWood is in, in like the two minute summary. So today, what I want to cover is um, the activity in the project for the past more or less two years. So covering between uh, 2017-11 to 2019-11, um, uh, which is not yet there, but we're uh, approaching that. And talking about things like community activity, the release schedule, architecture support, toolchain support, what we've improved in the package infrastructures, in the download infrastructure, uh, some interesting package updates and additions, uh, talk a bit about reproducible builds, top-level parallel builds, some tooling improvements we've done, 
So I'm going to cover all of those topics in that um, What's New talk. So the community activity, I uh, very often like to, to look at that just to see how the community is going. Is it, is it um, increasing, decreasing in size? Is it, uh, the activity is it increasing or not? Um, so I have a few graphs here that show the number of commits per release. Uh, all the way back from um, uh, 2009, which is when we started doing stable releases. Uh, before that, it was just like rolling release. Um, since uh, more than two years, uh, 10 years, so we have uh, do stable releases. You can see after a, a ramp up, uh, we kind of stabilized around 1,200, 1,000 commits per release. So it's, yeah, it's not decreasing or increasing. It's mainly a stable uh, project from a number of commits point of view. And we'll see that it's in fact the same for uh, the other um, uh, criteria that I'll be looking at. Number of contributors per release. We have about 100 different contributors per release, and as you can see, it's fairly stable. Um, sometimes goes up to 120, sometimes a little bit below 100, but it's fairly stable over the past uh, five, five years approximately. So it's a fairly, um, a decently large community, not of course as large as the Linux kernel, but the scope of the project is also much smaller. Uh, but it's in, I guess, in the range of, well, of many of those uh, mid-sized open source projects. Um, emails on the mailing list, we have uh, approximately, well, let's say, 2,000 to 3,000 emails uh, per month. So it's a fairly active uh, mailing list. So we have a, a development process similar to the one of the Linux kernel in the sense that patches are posted to the mailing list, review appends on the mailing list, um, and, and we have patchwork tracking our patches. So this also explains why there is so much mailing list activity, because there are lots of patches, lots of discussion going on, and all that adds up to uh, the number of emails exchanged on the mailing list. But it's, again, fairly stable. We can see some spikes uh, and then and that some downs, usually uh, summertime and Christmas time, we have a few downs. And, and, and when it's release time, we have a few ups, uh, which I guess is matches with the release schedule of the project. So a fairly, I would say, active project and in, in a stable state of, of uh, development. In terms of release schedule, We've had for uh, many, many years, basically all the way back to um, uh, 2009-02, which was our first uh, stable release, uh, four releases a year in February, May, August, and November, and we've been doing that for 10 years with no exception. Um, we have, therefore, three months development cycles, and we do that a little bit differently than the kernel because, well, the project is different, of course. Uh, we have a two-month development period where we can merge uh, pretty much any change, uh, big or small. Um, and then after that, we have uh, RC1, which kind of says that's the end of the development period, and uh, we have a one-month stabilization period, uh, during which a few RCs are released, and then we get the final release. So same idea than the Linux kernel in, in the sense that uh, RC1 uh, ends the development period, but the, the ratio uh, in terms of duration between development and stabilization is, is a bit different. Uh, so it's been going on like this for about 10 years, as I said. What we've added in the recent years um, is the concept of LTS, so long-term support release. Uh, until then, uh, once a release was done, it was kind of a, a um, give and forget um, situation where it was released, but uh, if you want new updates, especially for security fixes and, and, and bug fixes, you would have to simply keep up and, 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 and update to the next release. So what we're doing now is that every year we're picking up the O2 release uh, and maintain it during one year for uh, security updates and bug fixes. So one year is not yet very long term, but it's already an improvement over three months. Um, and it's proving to be already quite um, some work uh, to do that. Um, so this allows companies who want to build products based on BuildRoot to know that every year they have this uh, update uh, schedule uh, that they can uh, rely on and, and base their organization and, and planning on. Um, so in all of those uh, O2 branches, we have, as I said, maintenance branches, and we push uh, commits and make regular point releases more or less every month. So I've got some statistics here uh, where you can see that the 2017 O2 branch had uh, 11 point release, uh, about 800 commits, and same for 2018 O2, which had 12 point releases, about 1,000 commits. And so, of course, the 2019-02 branch is still being maintained today until 2020-02, uh, at which point we'll move to that one. So this is a new thing that, that we have. It's been working very well so far. We're seeing a number of um, uh, people and companies using those uh, LTS branches, uh, reporting uh, bugs, issues, or helping simply maintain um, those, those branches by uh, yeah, submitting patches to fix security problems that affect those slightly older versions than, than what we have in the, in the master branch. 
Um, architecture support, um, of course, we've uh, followed the, the, the train of uh, RISC-V uh, appearing. So we have support for uh, RISC-V 32 bits and 64 bits, um, supporting uh, uh, GLIPC um, on both of those um, bitness, and I think uh, Muscle on the 64 bit variant. Um, the NDF32 architecture was also added. It's an architecture designed by a, a company in China. Um, so both of these architecture have been added and people are, are working on, on well, fixing build issues that, that fall out from these, the, the addition of these architectures. We've added support for new variants of existing architecture like the new ARM core, the new x86 core, simply flowing uh, the new um, CPUs that come up from existing vendors. We've dropped the Blackfin architecture. It was dropped from the Linux kernel and, and was anyway difficult to maintain and barely used. So that, got, uh, that is something that we got rid of. And um, that means that today we have support for this complete list of architecture that you see here. So of course the big names, uh, ARM x86, ARM64 and, and so on. But we also support more niche um, CPU architectures. Uh, CSKY, OpenRISC, NIOS2, MicroBlaze, all of those CPU architectures that are very often not supported by other build systems. Um, I think Open Embedded doesn't have support for as many um, CPU architectures. Uh, we do have uh, support for. On the toolchain support side, um, so BuildWood can build its own cross-compilation toolchain by building GCC and Binutils and a C library. There hasn't been much change here uh, in, in, the, in, uh, in, the, in the features that we provide, uh, except that we keep things up to date with um, GCC updates and Binutils updates and UserLibc updates and Muscle updates and so on. So everything is pretty much up to the latest stable version or close to that. Um, so that's something that is uh, kept regularly updated. And there is some very useful testing work done by Romain Nao from, from Smile um, using a, a, the Toolchain Builder project uh, where, uh, thanks to CI, uh, we are able to, to test when there's a new GCC release on all, almost all the architecture we support, at least the ones that have QMU support. Um, use the new GCC release, build a complete um, uh, Linux kernel plus user space system, run that under QMU, make a few checks. And, and that on all um, CPU architectures with all the C libraries that we support, uh, all automated in CI. So that's a very good effort that has led to a number of contributions in, in our bug report in GCC, Binutils, or C libraries pointing, hey, this new GCC release breaks muscle on this weird CPU architecture. So all of that is, is of course, very useful and, and helps improve the, the quality of build root. The other thing that BuildWood can do with toolchain is reuse existing toolchain. Uh, you have one provided by your vendor or simply you don't want to spend the time building a toolchain. Uh, you can use um, pre-built toolchains. So we've added the toolchain from ARM because they didn't exist uh, back, uh, back then. Uh, so they have toolchain for uh, ARM32 and uh, ARM64, both little engine and big engine. So all of that was added. Just go in menu config, you can use those toolchains. We've added support for ARM64 begin and toolchains from Linaro as well. Uh, the NGS32 toolchain was added as part of adding these new CPU architectures. And generally, they've been updates to the existing external toolchains from the various vendors that we support. Another thing that has been added, a uh, fairly advanced feature, is the uh, capability of declaring external toolchains from BR2 external trees. I'm going to give a little bit of background on that. BR2 external is a mechanism that was added um, a couple of years ago in BuildWood, which allows you to declare uh, BuildWood packages, dev configs, and a bunch of other BuildWood artifacts outside of the main BuildWood source tree. So this allows you to keep your own custom packages really cleanly separated from, from the core of BuildWood itself, which some people find it easier to, to up when you have to update BuildWood as your packages are, are nicely separated. And external toolchains could not be declared in, the, in, 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 in such external trees because of the way it, it works internally and it's, it's something we have improved and now you can declare your own custom external toolchains in your BR2 external tree, which again helps you cleanly isolate your uh, secret source from, from the, the main uh, build root source tree. Um, package infrastructures. So in, in BuildRoot, we have the concept of package infrastructure, which basically factorizes the common logic of configuring, building, installing packages. When you have 500 packages that use the auto tools, you don't want to repeat the, the source of de describing dot slash configure, blah, 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 for 500 packages. You factorize that in a common place. So we've got infrastructure for most of the major build systems like auto tools and CMake and, and, and things like this. And we've added uh, two in the, last, in the past two years for Golong packages, 
and uh, probably more importantly, the Maison-based uh, um, packages as well, uh, because this is becoming a very popular uh, build system, so many uh, uh, software components are moving to Maison, so we uh, support that as well. So it looks like this, so this is uh, docker cli.mk, um, so this is the uh, entire makefile um, and build that allows to build the Docker uh, command line interface, and it's written in Go. So we declare a bunch of variables describing which version we want to use from uh, which GitHub uh, repository we clone it, which license it uses, what are the dependencies, and then a bunch of Go-specific uh, variables that we define and that are used by the magic macro at the end Golang package to expand to uh, the set of steps that are needed to configure, build, and install this package. Um, similar example, but this time for the Maison package infrastructure, and actually a simpler example here for libmpd client. And the principle is very much the same. You declare uh, where to grab the source code from. So in that case, it's just a tarball over HTTP. What is the license of that um, uh, package and that you want to install it to staging because that's a library. And then simply you invoke this magic macro Maison package that again expands to uh, how to configure, how to build, and how to install that package. And all that knowledge is factorized in the definition of the Maison package infrastructure so it's not duplicated over uh, uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of packages. So that's, these are the two package infrastructure that we've added in recent times. Another thing that uh, has been improved in the, in the core infrastructure is the download infrastructure. So um, as seen below, uh, there's been a major re rewrite of the internals, but it's not so useful for the, the end user. The main um, improvement from an um, end user point of view is uh, git caching. Um, so um, I need to, again, here give a good bit of background. So before that, when uh, you were specifying um, um, a git clone, so this one is a bit special from a GitHub, it's not really a git clone, but a package that you need to fetch from git, like your Linux kernel tree, for example. You say, it's available from that git repository, and I want to fetch tag this, this, this. What build would do, it would clone that repository, um, check out the version that you specify, create a tarball out of that specific version of the kernel that you uh, specified in your configuration, throw away the Git repository, and then use the tarball to do your build. So as long as you build again and again the same kernel version, we're good because we have the tarball locally cached and we don't go uh, back to the, the, the Git repository. But the next time you change the version of the kernel that you want to build in your, in your system, and during development it happens usually quite often, um, what Buildwood would do is, oh, I don't have this uh, kernel version locally available as a tarball, so let's go to the Git repo, do a full clone, check out the version, and so on. And you can imagine doing a full clone of the kernel each time uh, you change uh, the version for just uh, grabbing two th or three more commits. It's not very efficient. So we've changed that, and we now do, I think, what is the obvious thing that we should do. Um, keep a local cache of the Git repository um, so that the next time you, you try to fetch uh, the kernel source code, or of course it's valid for every uh, uh, Git-based project, we have a local clone available and we just grab the, the additional objects that are missing, use that to produce the tarball, and we move on. So we've moved from a very long, repetitive, complete clones of repositories to using a local repository and only grab the missing Git objects to uh, achieve, well, the, the specific version of the, the software component you wanted to, uh, to clone. Um, so the way it's organized is shown here. We have, um, so is the mouse working? Yes. So we have uh, DLDR, which is the, the top uh, directory where all the downloads are, are stored. It's now organized in subdirectories. So for those of you who are familiar with Buildwood, it, it used to be like this, this big dump of, of tarballs and stuff. So now we have one subdirectory per package, which makes it a little bit nicer. So this is an example of a package that always fetched uh, through like HTTP or FTP, and we have tarballs, so just the tarballs are nicely all grouped together in a, in a folder. But Uboot is sometimes fetched as complete tarballs. As you can see here, these are the official versions. But sometimes in this uh, example, uh, we sometimes fetch over Git, so we have a Git subfolder which contains uh, the complete Git repository of that project, including the .git metadata, and we use that um, every time uh, Buildwood needs to grab a given Uboot version and produce corresponding tarballs. Uh, so here, ashes were used to identify the versions. So that's a slight reorganization of the download directory. Uh, we were careful to, to keep backward compatibility with uh, previous download directories, all of that kind of stuff is handled. 
but the organization is a little bit different now. Um, in terms of package updates and additions, this is actually uh, where most of the activity in, in Beardroot occurs. Maintaining this set of um, 2,500 packages is, is a lot of work and requires contributions for, uh, from a large number of people. Um, but it's, it's mostly pretty boring, right? It's just um, new packages being added to support another Python module or updating packages here and there. So I kind of tried to extract a few highlights of that. Um, so we've added uh, 378 packages, uh, removed 56 packages, but 30 of which uh, are x.org proto packages, so x.org had split packages for all the header files, and now they have a single one replacing this, so it kind of screws up the, the number of 56 packages being removed. We removed Qt4. Um, it was long uh, kind of deprecated, and, and we had to move on and, and keep only Qt5. Among the things that we've added that are kind of, um, uh, I would say, major, we added support for Rust, um, so the compiler itself and, and the package manager as well. Uh, we added support for LLVM Clang, so not yet as a compiler. There is work being done around that, but for now it's only to have Clang on the target for things like OpenCL, um, but not yet to use as a compiler for building the entire system. Uh, we've added the OTA software Mender, OpenGDK to have another um, uh, Java VM on the target, the OpenRC init system, the Opti secure um, trust zone side OS, uh, and zillions of Perl and Python modules. And when I say zillions, it's like really zillions of more mm, additional Python modules and Perl modules. Um, most of the major software stacks have been updated. So we have Qt 5.12, uh, latest x.org, latest gstreamer, uh, Wayland, uh, Weston, Cody, and I, there's probably more that I missed because reviewing all those commits was kind of um, a boring thing to do and extract the highlights is not necessarily necess uh, easy. So I just had a quick look at um, our um, uh, history of commits, and, and whenever a package is updated, we usually do package foo bump to version XYZ in, in the commit title. So I look at all the commits that had bump in their title as a kind of an approximation of how many commits were done uh, to simply bump packages, and it's about 3,000 commits that were done um, in, in the course of um, a bit, little bit less than two years um, to keep our uh, set of packages updated. So most of the work is actually going on, on uh, keeping packages up to date and adding new packages. Uh, let me check the time. All right. Um, another thing that we've added are hardening options, so support for uh, increasing the security of the binaries that we produce uh, against uh, uh, certain classes of, of vulnerabilities. Um, so stack protection, uh, rail row, and um, buffer overflow detection with the Fortify source options. We All of that was added so you can build a, a uh, firmware that is more secure binaries. Uh, so it's quite, quite nice. And we've recently added uh, more testing effort around those and possibly we'll move to uh, defaulting to some of those options uh, be, the, be the default rather than, than no protection at all. But that's like on the radar for the future. Another thing we've added is make show info. It's a target uh, that spits out um, a JSON blurb that looks like what you can see on the right side of the slide here. It basically tells you details about all the packages that are enabled in your current configuration. The name and the version and the license and all that kind of things. And then you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, parsing it to write a nice HTML page that describes what is in your products or download uh, the, the tarballs that are needed to reproduce the build of that product. Basically whatever you want. It's just some metadata about your configuration that you can easily parse because it's JSON. We've done some work around reproducible builds, where the idea is that given a build root configuration version, if you do two builds of the same configuration, you get the same uh, binary identical result. Um, so there was a Google summer of code um, this summer uh, with Atarva Lele, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing correctly, working on this topic. And he was mentored by uh, two uh, core build root developers, Arnaut and Jan and um, on improving the support for that in Buildwood. There was already some initial work that had been done in the past, but it kind of pushed that a bit further. And it's mainly on the testing side it has been pushed a bit further because our build infrastructure that already existed has been extended to test reproducible builds. So what we do is that um, for some builds, we do the build two times, and we do it in two different folders so that we uh, test the different, we'll test uh, builds that have a difference in terms of time and build location. 
So for Node, the build environment is the same. It's the same build machine that is used to do build number one, build number two, but time and build location is different. Uh, doing builds in different environments is like something we would like to do, but in the future, we kind of take it step by step and not introduce too much randomization at first and, and first fix those, those issues. Uh, number of issues in TAR, GZIP, CPIO handling around timestamps were fixed, uh, around paths as well. But of course, more work is needed. But we do have reports like that uh, in automated fashion. So when a, a build fails um, because of a reproducibility issue, so basically the build succeeded, but the, the file system images are not binary identical. So we compare them with this tool called Diffoscope, which investigates the, the file system image. In that case, it's a tarball. It sees the difference in, in that case in a shared object from the asterisk software and then uses uh, read ELF to go inside the binary, identify very specifically which part of the binary has a difference. And you can see here output one, output two. These are the, the separate folders we use for build number one, build number two. So it sneaks in into one of the binaries. Someone needs to figure out why and how to fix it, but at least we detect it and we have a very clear um, um, idea of uh, what the problem is. Another topic that has um, made some amount of progress, even if not enough, is top level parallel build. Um, so right now, um, the way build works is that builds are linear. Uh, every package is built after the other. Within each package, we leverage multiple cores by using make minus J something, depending on your number of CPUs. But packages are built one after the other. And what top level parallel builds allows to do is to do this. Um, use your uh, multiple cores to build um, multiple packages in parallel, of course, as long as they don't have any dependency relationship. So this is something that has been in the works for quite some time. And the main thing that remains to be done is, and that for which we already have patches, they have been posted, so it's really in, in, in the works, uh, is per package directories, where the idea is to isolate the build of every package so that even if other packages get built in parallel, they, they won't interfere with the build of other packages. So without going into the details, it's really isolating the build of each package in its own little environment, so that having parallel build is not going to cause um, uh, confusion in the build of other packages. So in this example, uh, that build, which is not very representative, it doesn't have that many packages, was about more than 500 seconds. And with top level parallel build enabled, it was down to yeah, 300, I don't know, 70-ish or 80-ish seconds. So it's already a good improvement. It, I think the improvement can be better with uh, bigger configurations, which have more uh, packages that don't have dependencies with each other. Because we can see here, there's a chain of dependency here where no parallelization occurs, because this depends on that, which depends on this, which depends on that, which depends on this. So this is something we're working on. It's not yet there, but yeah, hopefully 2020 will be the year of top level parallel build in Buildwood, just like it should be the year of Flonix on the desktop. Um, runtime tests, this is another thing we've, we've added um, uh, in 2017-02, uh, so it was already there in, uh, compared to the two year time span I'm, I'm looking at, but uh, it was improved quite significantly. So this runtime test infrastructure basically allows us to um, have a set of well-defined build root configuration that build a system for ARM with this piece of user space software, uh, builds it, boots it under QMU, and runs a bunch of comments to verify that whatever we want is working. Let's say this Python module or drop bear is running or that kind of things. And these um, tests are uh, executed in our CI, so that's uh, for now it's once a week. We run the entire uh, set of uh, test cases and make sure that they continue to run. And this uh, runtime test infrastructure was mainly improved with additional test cases. So we uh, moved from, I think, a few uh, dozens of test cases to a few hundreds of test cases or something like that. Uh, testing Python modules, per module, UI module, open GDK, and Docker, and hardening flags, and lots of other features. And we, of course, need many more, but it's been a lot of improvement. And if you want an, in, an easy way to contribute to build roots, that's a very good uh, starting point. Oh, adding uh, one or two more uh, additional tests. Um, there's been also tooling improvements. So next, there was a Google Summer of Code on one side with Atarva, and on the other side, there was an internship um, in, in France at, at Bootlin, where um, uh, Victor Wesca, a student from France, uh, worked with me uh, during the summer to improve some of the tooling we have uh, around Bootloot to maintain it. 
And this is mainly around um, release monitoring for tracking upstream releases, um, notification to developers, and autopiler search capabilities. I'm going to give a few more details. So releasemonitoring.org is a website from the Fedora community that tracks up upstream releases open source projects. So it looks like this for the BuzzyBox project. So they know BuzzyBox is hosted there, and they regularly poll their like, HTTP site to know when new releases are made. And they provide an HTTP API we can query to know what, is the, what are the latest version of BuzzyBox available. Um, so it tracks 27,000 um, projects, and uh, BuildRoot has, of course, a lot less. But even with 2,500 packages uh, that we maintain, it's difficult to keep all of them up to date. So what we have done is that we have extended our tool that produces this table for every BuildRoot package. Um, it knows the current version, which is this column. So that's the version we currently have in BuildRoot. And another column shows what release monitoring knows about that package. So for example, this is not up to date. That's an example. So this kind of gives us a hint, oh, maybe we should have a look. What are the improvements in that package? Are there security fixes there? Is there anything interesting? Um, so we've done a number of improvements to that script to basically query release monitoring, improve the speeds and of the script, and other things like that. So that's, that was an initial uh, tooling improvement that, that was done. And this page is public. You can go to autobuildboard.org slash stats, and you've got this page updated on a daily basis. Based on that, we've done improvements to uh, the notifications sent to developers. So very much like the Linux kernel as a maintainer's file, we have a developer's file that says, this package, this dev config, and this test is maintained by this or that person uh, with this email address. And we use that to send emails. So we were already using that to send email about build failures occurring in our, our autobuilder infrastructure. And we've extended that to send notifications about packages that are not up to date. Hey, you are maintaining DropBear, but DropBear is at version this in BuildRoot, and there is this newer version available upstream. Maybe you should have a look and, and submit a patch and, 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 and provide an update to that. We've also uh, extended it to uh, notify developers when their, the dev configs they maintain uh, no longer build in our CI, or when one of the tests they maintain no longer build or runs in, in our CI. So it gives something like this for the um, um, version um, uh, uh, notification. So it says, hey, package ACPICA is at version this, this, this in build root and upstream as that. Uh, maybe you should have a look at that. So this is sent both to individual developers about the, the packages they care about, and also to the mailing list about all packages so that the entire community can, can participate to, to the effort. And here is the same idea for what I say, dev config failures and runtime test failures when a dev config like for a particular platform no longer builds or when a given test uh, no longer uh, builds or runs. Uh, we've improved the search capabilities in our auto builders. So our auto builder is a, a farm of build machines that 24-7 uh, uh, generate random build root configurations, build, and provide the result. And it allows us to detect dependency problems, version compatibility issues, the fact that this given package on this given architecture with these optimization flags and these hardening flags doesn't build. And we've been running that for many years. And um, the improvement we've done is basically be able to search in the history of build results by config symbol so that we can answer questions like, what were the build results that were successful on ARM with Uselipsy and that had the BuzzyBox package enabled? So of course, for BuzzyBox, it usually builds fine, so that's not a very good example. But sometimes it helps us investigate since when something started to fail, until when it was still working and when it started it failing. So that's a very a nice improvement for mainly the, the core build with developers when they are investigating uh, build issues, try to understand the scope. Is it only appearing on one CPU architecture or multiple CPU architecture? Is it appearing uh, only when we have this combination of that package and that package enabled or not? So that's kind of helping us answer those questions. So it looks like this. It's a very simple page um, that you can give all your search criteria and it gives you a, a, a list of build results. Um, we've got a few other smaller improvements that were not worth adding their entire slides. Um, a make a Linux diff config uh, target that shows you the difference between the current uh, configuration you're using for the Linux kernel because you've changed it, you've edited it, and the one you have stored for your platform configuration. So it shows you, okay, you have enabled that driver, that other driver, maybe you need to update your configuration uh, accordingly. 
uh, we have support for generating images, uh, file system images in the F2FS and ButterFS uh, file system formats. So in addition to the usual, as I said, ext4 and squashFS and UBIFS. And finally, we've um, added support for GetTextTiny as an alternative for the full-blown GNU GetText. So if you don't need um, a complete um, a native language support with translations, and you can work with just a stub that does no translation. Get text tiny is nice. It has a smaller footprint, smaller build time. So we know support both of these um, alternatives for uh, uh, the get text implementation. So to conclude, um, project is active. We've seen with the, 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 the commits and a number of contributors. Uh, we've got LTS release once a year with security and bug fixes a few new CPU architectures, um, new packet infrastructure to cover new build system that show up, uh, the Git caching um, feature uh, in the download infrastructure, the fact that we keep packages um, up to date, we have many new packages and uh, um, new notifications around release monitoring is even pushing that further and we see a good increase in the number of um, uh, contributions uh, in this area because people receive notifications so they submit patches to help uh, keep their packages updated. Um, reproducible build in effort in, in progress. There's been a good push and we hope to uh, continue that effort. And uh, as I said, uh, maintenance tooling improvements as well uh, were done. Um, there is a tutorial on build route uh, on Wednesday if you're interested uh, about the basics. And other than that, I'm, I'm about done. Um, I don't know if I have time for questions. No. Um, maybe I'll take one just to pretend I took questions and otherwise I'll be in the hallway for the entire conference so feel free to uh, hang at me and ask questions. Maybe one question and then uh, I'll give the, time, the, the microphone to the next speaker. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> one question? Yes, please. So what's the best way to do an initrime FS with build root? Well, that's, I was hoping for a quicker question. Um, so it depends. If you boot your entire system to an initrime FS and stay there and never switch to a root file system, that, that's kind of easy. But if you have this combination of you need an, an initrime FS and a root file system and you switch between the two um, during the boot process, then essentially you need two build root configurations. One to build the complete uh, root file system and one to build the inner trim FS and then some kind of glue between the two uh, to combine them. That's the kind of 30 second answer I can give. All right, thanks a lot. Again, I'd be in the hallway if you have more questions and I want to leave the, the, the place for the next speaker. Thank you and have a good conference. <laughs> <laughs>